All right, so let's go into our next section. It's going to be the brain and cranial nerves. Super cool. We are going to finish, um, finish up with the brain and cranial nerves. And the way I've organized this um, is we're going to talk about the brain um, as in the cerebral cortex, the different um, centers of association, and the cranial nerves at the end. And then I'm going to start with the smaller pieces, the things like the brain stem and um, the general stuff like blood flow, venous flow to the brain and CSF. So we're going to talk about the general things in first, and then we'll start breaking down the different parts of the brain, starting with the smaller parts, working our way up to the cerebral cortex, which is your main part. Um, of course, we're not going to do all that today, but this will be the last portion of our unit before we test should be the brain and, and all the cranial nerves. All right, so we are going to look at organization, protection, and blood supply to the brain. Today we'll probably just do protection and blood supply. Um, and then we are going to talk about different areas of the brains and their functions, and that's going to be later on, probably uh, by the end of next week. And then we'll talk about a little bit of the functional organization, and then we'll do cranial nerves will be our last part. All right, so let's talk about brain embryology. Cool. Okay, do we really need to know this? Probably not, but you do want to know it because it's going to be the bonus on the test. Okay, so um, this is an embryo, which is like still not even a fetus, just after conception. This will be the bonus for your test and I'll tell you exactly which part I need you to know. The um, entire brain begins as a tube from ectoderm, and we call that the neural, neuro, neural tube. It's sort of like a blind-ended straw or a pouch. So you have to imagine that this red stuff in here, the yellow and the blue, these are all spaces. It's not actually tissue. So this is a hollow um, tube sort of like a test tube if it was upside down and I had little bubbles in it. So we've got three main bubbles here in the beginning. This is just a three to four week embryo. So this is probably around the time that you take a pregnancy test and you find out like the very first, um, the very first days of when you can find out that you're pregnant, right around three to four weeks. Um, and you've got three main bubbles here, the prosencephalon, um, which becomes a forebrain, the mesencephalon, the midbrain, and then the rhombencephalon is the hindbrain. Now, those three will later differentiate around the fifth week or so into um, these things here. So the prosencephalon becomes the telencephalon and diencephalon. The mesencephalon becomes mesencephalon. The rhombencephalon becomes metencephalon and myelencephalon. I know, right? A lot of cephalon. Cephalon means head, by the way. <laughs> okay, so this is the part that we need to really, really, really know very, very, very well. This ending part here. What does it start as? What does it end as? The telencephalon becomes your cerebrum. That's the main cerebral hemisphere. It's a big bulk of your brain. The diencephalon becomes the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. So diencephalon becomes thalamus. Mesencephalon becomes midbrain. Metencephalon becomes the pons and the cerebellum. And the myelencephalon will become the medulla oblongata. So when we're talking about those parts, notice your, your tube is differentiating. You're getting little bubbles, right? But keep in mind, inside, this is still hollow. It's just this light blue tissue on the outside. That's where you, what your brain starts at, is that thin blue line. Thin blue line. That is the same, right? Okay. Is it? No? Maybe in my head? All right. Okay, so what happens to those spaces? Well, those spaces will actually become the ventricles. So look at this. You've got your lateral ventricles up here, your third ventricle right there, your aqueduct is that yellow part, and then you have your fourth ventricle in blue. So the Outer parts of the tube become the brain and the cerebellum. The inside, those hollow spaces, will become the ventricles. And that is how it all begins. I know, right? So small and tiny. But anyways, you do want to know, you want to make sure you understand or be able to match these up. 
with what it started as embryologically and what it becomes when it's fully developed. Okay? All right, so this is what a hemisphere and part of the cerebellum will look like if we cut the brain in half like you did in lab this morning or um, like you're going to this week. And so the ones that had lab this morning, this will be super easy because you've already seen most of this. Um, if not, just imagine this was my brain and I sliced myself in left and right halves. This is what I'm looking at. Um, up here, this is the cerebrum. It is actually what we're looking at exactly is half of the cerebrum, which is a cerebral hemisphere. And then you'll notice that, sorry, just below all of that, there's your cerebellum right there. Um, some other structures that we're going to learn about is the, right here is the thalamus. Below the thalamus is the hypothalamus. Just below that, you've got your midbrain, your pons, and your medulla. And then it continues as your brainstem after that. Let's look at some more details on a picture. So here's the, another picture, same slice, right down the middle, left and right halves. Um, this one is going to show you, you can actually see that intermediate mass inside of the thalamus. So there's your thalamus, there's your hypothalamus. Uh, you have a pineal gland, part of the midbrain in the back there, tectum, um, pons, medulla, and there's your midbrain. Now, um, you can see some of the spaces here too, but I don't want to talk about those spaces until we've discussed the spaces um, in lecture. Okay, And then right here, that is the pituitary gland, and we're going to learn that the pituitary gland is your master endocrine gland. It's the big boss of all the endocrine glands. Um, and that's the one that in lab, when we removed the dura, it came out with the dura and left a space where the hypothalamus was. Y'all stop me if you have questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going, going, going. OK. Maybe we'll be done with everything. We can take our test on um, Thursday. So seeing the brain is way better there, right? Because you can actually see those structures. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. All right, so protection for the brain. We've got three forms of protection. The first one is the bones. Obviously, your skull bones. You've already done those um, in AMP1. Your meninges, what are they? What are the layers? <gasps> Thank you. Which one's the outermost? Which one's the middle? And the innermost, thank you, I've done my job. Oh, look, I've made a mess too. Okay, so we have our meninges. Now, here's the thing. The dura that covers the uh, brain has two layers to it, okay? It has a layer that covers the brain itself and a layer that covers the bone. And we're going to talk about why, because that creates some spaces between the layers of dura. And in those spaces, we've inserted some venous sinuses that allow us to drain venous blood from the, um, from the brain. But you do need to know that dura is two layers inside of the skull and the cranium. And then, so bones, meninges, we also have fluid. We have cerebral spinal fluid. That is your CSF. We're going to talk about how it's made, how it circulates, and where it leaves or where it's uh, reabsorbed into the venous blood system. And CSF is super cool because it's kind of like um, it lets the brain just kind of hover and swim in this liquid that's nice and juicy and offers so much um, food, nutrition, and fun. So much fun. All right, so here's a look. This is the slice that we're looking at right here. So if I were to slice your skull um, in half, front and back, and then get that top part, this is what I'm seeing. So in green here, this is the dura. Notice that we have two layers of dura. You've got a layer that covers the bone, and then you have a layer that covers the actual brain. Why is that cool? Because it creates this blue triangle in here, and that blue triangle, this right here, is a sinus. I'm not going to make you memorize the sinuses. There are several sinuses that all join and eventually dump into the jugular veins, but that's where the venous blood is collected from our brains, okay? And what's even cooler, and I want you to remember, because we're going to go back to um, talk about these when we talk about CSF, are these little um, pink 
bubbles or arms that stick into that sinus. Those are called arachnoid villi. And those arachnoid villi, obviously arachnoid, they come from the arachnoid matter. They're little projections of arachnoid matter that will dip into that sinus. And that's going to be important when we're talking about CSF. So I want you to remember those, remember where they are. You've got your um, arachnoid villi sticking inside of that sinus from the arachnoid matter. Okay? Extensions of the dura. We've already seen two of these. You're only going to see two in lab. Um, and then there's one other one that we don't really talk about. But um, there are parts where the dura will dip in between either you know, the left and right hemispheres or between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. It'll come in and fold over itself to create that separation. That happens in three different spots that you need to know. The falx cerebri, bri, separates the left and right hemispheres, and we saw that in um, lab, even though it wasn't really well defined, it's much smaller. Um, the falx cerebelli, anytime you see belli, it is going to be the cerebellum. So the cerebellum also has lobes, and it also has a, fal a falx that separates the lobes into left and right. So the falx cerebelli separates the cerebellar hemispheres. Um, we didn't see that because we're looking at sheep. So we don't really see a, um, a definite definition between those hemispheres. And then the tentorium cerebelli, again, it says belli, so that has to be the cerebellum. The tentorium is what separates the cerebellum, separates cere the cere cerebellum from the cerebrum. Okay? Y'all? All right, so those three extensions of the dura, you do need to know them and know where they are. And it should not be hard. Just saying. All right. Blood flow to the brain. What do you need to know? The internal jugular, oh, sorry, internal carotid arteries will bring in oxygenated blood to the brain. And then the internal jugulars will drain that venous blood from the sinuses. So you've got vertebral and carotid bringing it in, and then you have your internal jugular taking it out. Pretty simple, right? Okay, blood flow to the brain is essential. Super, super, super important. Without oxygen or glucose, our brains cannot function. We'll talk about that in a minute. But because blood flow to the brain is so important, there is an, anas an osmosis of arteries at the base of the brain called the circle of Willis. Circle of Willis. So what does that mean? It means that you have a bunch of arteries that are all interconnecting. They're actually kind of create, it looks more like an oval or a triangle, but they create this network of uh, blood vessels by tying into each other so that if one of them is clogged or torn or inoperable, another one can take its place. Okay, and that is called the circle of Willis. It's, it's sort of nature's way of making sure that the brain is never deprived of blood flow because it is essential. Um, you know, we've got organs that we can replace all the time. You can do dialysis for a kidney. You can have um, a liver transplant, a heart transplant. You can be on a pacemaker. You can be on a ventilator. Most of our organs we can either transplant or replace with a machine with the exception of the brain. That's the one thing that doesn't repair itself, and we have not found a way to transplant someone else's brain into you, or find a way to have a computer or machine that can think for you. We just aren't there. Um, so the brain is super, super precious. It's the one thing we can't do without, and it's the one thing that can't fix itself, and we really can't fix either. So um, take care of your brain. It goes back to that commercial, this is your brain. <laughs> Okay, so look at this, the, blood, the uh, brain takes up 20% of your body's oxygen supply. That's huge, considering it's way up here and it's not that big. But it takes up that much blood, that much oxygen. 20% of your oxygen supply of your entire body goes solely to your brain. Now, if that oxygen is um, interrupted or low, you're going to end up with things like uh, weakness, uh, permanent damage. Oops, 
I don't know how that happened. Permanent damage or even death. You can die simply by uh, preventing oxygen from going to the brain. That's called suffocation. Yeah, right? I know. Now you guys have more ammo to be like, we can't wear masks because we could suffocate and die. Because um, our brain needs that oxygen. Okay, so yeah, it can, it'll be weaker. It may cause permanent damage. If it's a temporary thing and the oxygen is returned, it may have already caused the damage or um, death of those cells. So you know already that when those neurons die, you can't replace them in the central nervous system, right? So that's why oxygen levels are monitored um, when you see patients in ICU because it is essential that they get enough oxygen for the brain um, to remain viable and working. And then it also requires a lot of glucose. Um, glucose deficiency. This is something we probably have all felt at some point, right? When the first stage is like hangry because you deprive your neurons of glucose, they become irritable. And a person can become irritable when they're hungry. The next stage is you're going to have some type of um, confusion, being tired. We call that lethargic, right? So you'll go through those stages um, with dizziness, mental confusion, lethargy, then you go into convulsions, and eventually you could reach unconsciousness simply from the lack of glucose. Um, that's how important glucose is to our brain. Does it mean you should walk around with a glucose IV? No, because our bodies are created that they can turn just about anything into glucose, no matter what you eat. Um, it will be turned into glucose for your brain. Right? Okay. How is glucose stored in the body? Just random facts here. You took this in AMP1. We store glucose as glycogen, right? No? Maybe? Maybe just a little bit sometimes? Okay, that's okay. I love how you guys have the ability to erase like the entire semester when you go to a new one. Kind of wish I could do that, um, but no. Y'all don't, don't erase this stuff, it's, it's important. You need it, you need to carry it on with you. Like you're about to finish A and P2, you wanna take that with you to microbiology if you're going on to do that. You wanna take it with you to pharmacology, I promise it's gonna help you. And you can tie all this stuff together, don't try to forget stuff. Okay, so that is the importance of our blood, oxygen and glucose levels to our brain, obviously essential. Also important to that is the blood-brain barrier. Which cell was it that created that blood-brain barrier was responsible for it? Astrocytes, that's right. Astrocytes are responsible for the blood-brain barrier. And the purpose of this barrier is to protect your brain from all of the harmful substances that can get into our blood and pass to the brain. Um, so it's a sort of filter made of cells that's meant to stop harmful things from getting to this precious brain, um, you know, that's really sensitive and likes oxygen and glucose and doesn't really want much of anything else. Um, so it can stop even, it says here it can stop uh, the entry of therapeutic drugs. Therapeutic drugs would be things that we use to treat patients with, like, um, you know, whatever medicine you're on. It could stop that. Not everything passes the blood-brain barrier. However, when there is uh, injury to the brain, whenever you have a brain injury, the cells that are there, they, some of those astrocytes may have died off. Some of them may have been replaced by scar tissue. Um, all of that weakens that barrier. When you weaken that barrier, things are more likely to pass through and get in. So this is why you'll find that um, our elderly population, anyone that's had a traumatic brain injury um, or maybe recovering from a concussion or something like that, anything that can hurt your brain can weaken that barrier. And once that happens, you have to be really conscious of it because any patient in that situation is likely to need some adjustment in dosing because what normally would not have affected them will affect them very quickly when they um, have any type of injury here because now you have everything passing so you have to be really careful with that um, with those medications and things that you're doing. 
I guess if you go on to medical school, you'll talk all about this again, so you'll be all right. But that is the idea. So if you have like a grandma or something that's in the hospital and, um, you know, she starts talking about like weird stuff or hallucinating or talking to people that aren't there, no, she's not losing her mind. It's temporary and it goes away, but it's probably just caused from those medications and a little bit of brain injury will cause those things to affect them um, much quicker and with much lower of a dose. Okay, so that is our blood-brain barrier. We good on that? You got any questions on it? I'm feeling hungry. Why? Mm -hmm. Nobody brought me breakfast today, and I'm starving. Okay, let's talk about CSF, our cerebrospinal fluid. So we have this fluid that is created. Um, by a network of blood vessels. It's filtered out of blood. So you got blood that's in these capillaries. They're going to filter out the stuff they want, create this fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. Fluid is going to be rich in oxygen, rich in uh, glucose, lots of nutrients. So not only does it bring nutrients to the brain, it also gives it this nice water bed to sit in. So the brain's almost suspended weightless in this fluid super cool stuff. It always reminds me of like, there used to be, whenever they had like scientists on TV and they're like in their lab and they would have like the brain sitting in the jar of liquid. <laughs> reminds me of that. Okay, so um, CSF is gonna protect our brain and spinal cord against chemical physical injuries. Yes, it carries oxygen, glucose, and other substances. Um, it is formed in the ventricles. And then it circulates through those ventricles and then through that subarachnoid space. And we're going to talk about the details of that. But just a quick overview, this what you're seeing here in blue, these are your lateral ventricles. So there's one here. This is one lateral ventricle. And then right behind it is that second one. They're actually, in reality, side by side. Okay. So those two lateral ventricles are just like that. And there is a sheet or a um, layer of tissue between them that divides them called the septum pellucidum. Okay, so at the floor of those lateral ventricles, they are open on to the next one, which is the third ventricle just below them. And that third ventricle, you've seen it in lab around the intermediate mass. You'll see it if you haven't yet, but it sort of just kind of hugs that intermediate mass. And then it travels through there through this canal called the cerebral aqueduct and into the fourth ventricle. Okay, and then from there, it's going to enter the subarachnoid space or go down that central canal. Let's look at it. Now, um, that network that's inside of those, uh, that vascular network inside of the ventricles that creates the CSF is called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus. Now, there are choroid plexuses in most of the ventricles. We like to pull it out of the lateral one or the third because those are always the most obvious. Um, but all those ventricles have the ability to have some of that choroid plexus. It's just very vascular. It has some special cells in it. It can take blood and filter out the fluid that it needs from the blood to create CSF. So it's all created up here, and then it circulates. Um, this is a pretty cool picture right here where you see one lateral ventricle here, the other one here, and you can actually see that septum that divides them, the septum pellucidum. And I think that's what I said today when I had cut that brain in half. I was like, oh, I guess some of the septum, because you don't really see it very often. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of like a hymen, you know, you don't, one of those things you know exists, but you don't ever really get to see much. Yeah. Do what? The two ventricles do what with the evil gray butterfly? Well, the two ventricles are considered. No, 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 this is the brain. So look, this is the brain right here. This is like I, my head and right, right on my forehead, I hit a machete that sliced the top of my brain off. And now I'm bending down like this and you're looking at those ventricles like that. Okay. Get it? Okay. But it does, yes, look like a butterfly, but we don't want to associate it that way. <laughs> okay. 
don't do that. Don't do that. All right, let's talk about this flow. Let me get a different color because I think the blue is not very obvious. What color do you guys want? Green? It's hard to hear. Oh no, okay. This thing is so sensitive. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's a little better. Let me see if my battery's died. And there's like no volume control or anything on here. It's almost like when you turn your jacket or something might get in the way of the mic. Y'all are, I don't know if it's the microphone that's sensitive or you guys are just really high maintenance. Um, here, here, Robert. How about I hold it? Is that better? You sound fine to me. Oh, see, it sounds fine to her. Dang. Okay, we're going green. Here we go. Let's see how this happens. So right here, this is the lateral ventricle. You see those little purple arrows? That is CSF being formed in that lateral ventricle. Comes down. Look, it is also extra being formed here in the third ventricle. Then what happens? Well, then we are going to flow down through that aqueduct, which I'm in right here, and then the fourth ventricle right across from the cerebellum. Now, in the fourth ventricle or after the fourth ventricle, it's going to enter the subarachnoid space. What the hell is a subarachnoid space? What is it? It's the space between the arachnoid and pia, right? Subarachnoid. Y'all better learn this. Okay. At the time that we talked about the spaces, epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, I said subarachnoid is important because that's where CSF flows. So the subarachnoid space is just below the arachnoid between arachnoid and pia. Okay. So now we've gone from the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space. Well, what happens then? Well, some of it's going to circle up around the brain or sorry, the cerebellum. Some of it's going to go down and wrap around this spinal cord in that subarachnoid space. Notice it does flow freely all around it. It sort of perfuses through that subarachnoid space, just completely engulfing the um, spinal cord in the subarachnoid space and also in that central canal. It is going to make its way back up the spinal cord and then on the outside right here, still in the subarachnoid space, but now I'm in that part between the cerebrum and the dura. I'm in subarachnoid space. Go through here and then look, that blue line that you see on the edge, that is the venous sinus that drains the venous blood from the brain. The arachnoid villi right there is where this CSF will go back into venous circulation. Okay? So we form it in the lateral and third ventricles mainly. You form it in the choroid plexus in the ventricles. It flows through those series of ventricles, goes into the um, subarachnoid space, covers the cerebellum, the spinal cord, comes back around the skull, and then eventually is drained into those. Um, sinuses, the venous sinuses that are on the border of the skull, yes, and it happens at the arachnoid villi. Cool. Okay, so let's look at it on this chart. We're starting with, um, let's start with the choroid plexus, okay? These are all choroid plexi. This is where it's formed. You form your CSF, it's going to flow through the ventricles, lateral, third, fourth ventricle. Then it goes to the subarachnoid space. Then it flows over all of the cerebellum, the spinal cord. It comes back up from the spinal cord um, in that subarachnoid space. will drain through the arachnoid villi into a venous sinus. That venous sinus will eventually drain into your internal jugular veins. Your internal jugular veins will end where eventually that blood goes. Hello? Yeah, eventually it's gonna end up in the superior vena cava and in the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart is going to send it to the lungs to get oxygen, and then it goes back to the left side. The left side sends it out as fresh, oxygenated blood, arterial blood, 
that flows, that same arterial blood is going to pass through those carotid arteries, go back to the brain to give it fresh oxygen, and the whole process starts over again because when that blood reaches the choroid plexus, it is going to be forming CSF from it again, and it's just a continuous renewal and recycle of CSF. Make sense? So we are constantly forming CSF from our arterial blood in those choroid plexuses, and then we are also draining it in the arachnoid villi. Continuous process. Now, sometimes things go wrong, right? Sometimes something in this pathway can be blocked. Oh yeah, I know. Like what if, what if my aqueduct is blocked right there? I have no aqueduct. I got a tumor that's grown. It's closed the aqueduct. I have no way for this CSF to flow normally and then be drained, right? So what happens when you have CSF that's forming but it's not being drained, it's not able to eventually reach those arachnoid villi and drain, you end up with increased fluid inside the skull in the brain. We call that hydrocephalus. So if it happens in an infant or a young child that's still developing, they end up with huge heads if it's not treated right away. And I'm gonna show you guys a picture because you need to see this. Okay, stop right there. Um, Want to pull up a picture of hydrocephalus? Actually, start that. Okay, super cool. I'm always a little scared when I'm pulling up pictures because I'm not really sure what I'm gonna find. Okay, so look, this is hydrocephalus. So this is a child that really, they're not mentally deficient. There's nothing wrong. The issue is just drainage of CSF. There's no way for that CSF to drain. And so it keeps accumulating CSF. At the same time, it's an infant, so the skull is still not fully formed. It's still pretty soft and it allows it to become huge. That's hydrocephalus. So that happens if you have that increased pressure from CSF in a small child. Now this child started healthy with a normal brain, but if this hydrocephalus is not treated, you're gonna end up compressing those neurons in that brain tissue with all of that fluid. And when you compress it, that's when you get brain damage, right? So this is something that has to be taken care of right away. I don't even understand how a parent can leave a child until their head gets that big. Um, but you know, it's probably, there's a lot of, um, hydrocephalus in third world countries that, you know, they just can't afford to do anything about. And so that's what happens. All right. So what's the aftermath of that? Like, is there any way to reduce the size of their head? Do they just grow up like that? Do they live? Um, if you catch it soon enough before those brain, the, um, the bones harden and stuff, you can fix it and they can be okay. But, um, if it's not taken care of, the child's not going to live very long. Like this child here, that's a mild case. You see it happening. This can be fixed. You put a shunt in. Um, and a, with a shunt, you simply bypass whatever is clogged. If that um, aqueduct is clogged, we can bypass it. So you bypass where the blockage is, and you end up with proper drainage. So um, if it's treated early enough, like this, this baby's really young. Um, and pretty mild, and it can be taken care of, and it's fine. Like hydrocephalus is totally treatable. Um, you just want to catch it before it's too late, before you end up with any um, with any type of this is a cool image here with any type of brain damage. I followed I somebody on social media that had a child with really extreme hydrocephalus. Wait, say it louder, Liz. I can't hear a thing. <laughs> Um, I followed somebody on social media back when I had social media um, that had a child with really, really severe hydrocephalus, and oh. nobody would operate on the child. Because it was severe? 
Yeah, I think there might have been something else going on. The child, like, started having seizures and stuff when they were three months old. Yeah. And they wouldn't um, do surgery then or anything like that. And so... Yeah. Um, it is it obviously... Got, yeah, it's it got really, to, really bad. Yeah, it's up to the surgeons or the neurosurgeon's discretion, and they'll be the ones to make that call um, because they'll know there may be other underlying issues. It not, may not be something they can treat, or it may be that... Um, the child already has a severe mental deficiency and there's like uh, no point in treating, but that would totally be up to the neurosurgeon crew. But I want to look at this picture just for a minute because right over here on the left, oh, I can't mark it, can I? The picture on the left is no hydrocephalus. This is a normal infant. Can I not get a pen on this too? Guess not. Okay. But this one right here, that is a uh, image of normal ventricles, normal child, no hydrocephalus going on here. Look at this one right here. This is what happens when you block it. So there's probably a block somewhere in the aqueduct right over here because what's happening, or no, there's your aqueduct. There's a block somewhere here that is causing CSF to be created and then it has nowhere to go. So it ends up making those ventricles really, really big. So those spaces will keep getting bigger um, as the brain is getting pushed out against the skull. So then the skull gets bigger and all of that is increased pressure inside of here. So what you end up doing is compressing this brain tissue until it's no longer functioning. Um, but that's why it has to be treated so early so that you don't have any damage or any compression of the tissue. Good question. That's exactly what I was going to next. So this is a result of, this is what happens when you increase intracranial pressure in a child. You end up with a skull that balloons up because that pressure is increased. What happens when you do it in an adult that has bone that is well-formed and cannot um, bend or reshape itself? When you increase intracranial pressure in an adult, your first symptom is going to be severe headache. You're going to have headaches, blurred vision, uh, loss of mental function, because now you have nowhere to go. It's almost unforgiving in an adult because these bones are so well formed. That's such, such a tight space. If you increase that pressure, you're going to be in a lot of pain. So it's going to be painful. You're going to have trouble seeing, trouble speaking, depending on which area is affected first all of the mental functions will begin to um, be affected. But it's always, usually it's blurry vision or pain, severe headaches that, that started off. They can go in and put a shunt. Yes. Right. Yeah. Do what? No, the shunt gets put depending on where the blockage is. But in, in most of the time, I mean, it's going to be investigated because in adults, you could have a tumor that's causing it. You could have other reasons that, you know, it doesn't have to be hydrocephalus for you to have those symptoms. So there could be something else that's increasing that uh, pressure inside, the intracranial pressure. So. Have okay, you ever so seen free air in a brain? Do what? Have you ever seen free air in somebody's brain? Free air in someone's brain. Mm -hmm. Do you want? I haven't seen it in real life. Do you want to see it? I, I mean, I've seen it. I was just wondering if it was something that was common. Because what is um, that? No, it's not common. <laughs> you should not have free air in your brain at what all. What is that? How does that even happen? Well, it, it, it only takes like a puncture or an accident or something to uh, defect all of your um, protective mechanisms. You end up with air inside here. Let's see if we can find an image with free air. This is the last slide we're doing today, by the way, this one right here. But because um, this is too much fun, sorry. I had a patient with it. It was a pilot, so what had happened was like some barotrauma, you know? Or um, did he um, 
<clears throat> he'd actually he'd gone flying and then he went commercially flying and uh... then somehow you know um it just happened but it was pretty it was interesting and i was just wondering how common that was ouch okay well let's see here's a here's an x-ray image of it here's a few images of it um yeah this one probably is the most clear one um and that one's kind of bizarre because it's like right in the middle but yeah, see how um, what happened here is this is probably some kind of accident or trauma. Notice that, see if I can make this bigger. I wish I could draw on this. Okay, so you guys can see my little hand arrow, right? See if I can make it bigger. How did you zoom in last time? Ah, there we go. Okay, so um, what happened here is probably an accident because look, this is a sinus. That's your frontal sinus on the frontal bone, right? Um, this bone right here should be connected, and this also should be connected here. Um, this is the ethmoid bone right here. So I'm seeing lots of fractures that would allow air into this space, right? So it's probably like a really bad um, accident. Oh, look, it says oh, that's awful. fracture of the frontal sinus. Yeah, so what happens with that is the air from the outside can actually penetrate and come into this cavity. When that happens, you've now pushed this brain aside because it's being replaced by air. No. So is that like but, you get in a car accident and like you hit your Yeah, that's, that's some wheel. kind of bad accident. Yeah. So um, let's see if they have any more cool pictures of the brain. This one here. That probably came in from like the ethmoid bone or through the nose or sinuses. Oh, secondary surgical wound. Maybe not us being creative, man. <laughs> I was like thinking of all right. the different ways, but I'm usually black like that. This is air on a on a scan. Um, My patient said it felt like they had um, bubbling inside their head. Yeah. Yeah, Look see, the, bone, the bone's white, tissue is gray, and here, this is the CSF that you're seeing that's like a darker gray, but any pitch black spots, those are all air. This is all air. How do you treat it? <laughs> Get that air out, close that bone up. <laughs> yeah. No, they, the air will, you need to really just, you need to fix the defect in the bone, uh, repair if you can, what was fractured or how that air got in. You got to find how it got in, fix it, and the, the air eventually just reabsorbs. It's not a big deal, especially if it's just a little bit. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. It just don't feel good for a while. Um, oh, no, I didn't want this one. I want the other one. Okay. That's cool. Um, let me finish this slide, and then we can look up some more cool stuff. Okay, so this is basically the same thing. We're talking about the ventrals again, but it's a different view. Look, it's a frontal plane, so I'm standing in front of you. Instead of cutting me into left and right halves, you're cutting me into front and back. Make sense? Make sense? Okay. So that's what we're looking at. And it's just a good look at those ventricles and how the CSF floats um, from those from the lateral ventricle. I feel like I'm gonna make this thing fall one time. It's just a little spiel about how it flows um, from these ventricles or starts here, it's formed oop, there in the third, there's that aqueduct, the fourth ventricle, and then there's that central canal. That's how they all fall in line with each other. And then at the same time, as it is um, passing through that fourth ventricle, it will enter that sub um, arachnoid space. So that's just a different look at it. And then, you know, it flows down and around here, um, comes back up, and then eventually drains in the arachnoid villi in the uh, venous sinuses. Any questions on that? Do what? Yes. 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 
we are arachnoid villi in all of these sinuses. Okay, so we can stop there. What time is it? I think we still have time, right? Huh? Yes. Oh, we still have like 15 minutes, right? Or 12 minutes. I can talk worth of 12 minutes on the brainstem. Let's get it, let's get it going. Okay, so that was the basics of like the things that protect our brain, the bone, the meninges, um, CSF. And then we talked about blood flow, venous flow, which artery supplies blood, which arteries supply blood to the brain. I'm making jeopardy for you guys. This is ridiculous. The internal carotid arteries and the vertebral artery, okay? And which vein collects the blood from those venous sinuses? The jugular, the internal jugular vein. Y'all are going to kill me. Okay. Yes, very good. Maybe we don't need to move on. Maybe we need to go back and talk about what we just did. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good time to move on. Okay, you guys are gonna study, right? All right, let's talk about the brainstem because I told you I wanted to break down the smaller bits and pieces and then go to the big cortex at the end. So the brainstem is made up of the medulla, the pons and the midbrain. Oh my gosh, okay. I reordered these and then I, so I was redoing my PowerPoints, right? And I was doing it here in my office um, and it froze up. I was towards the end, like I was literally on the last slide for the entire unit and the thing froze up and I couldn't get it to unfreeze. And so I ended up doing another PowerPoint, but, um, in my second attempt, I forgot that I had put these in order on that original one that I lost. So I do need to go back and put these back in order because the order going from the top down is first midbrain, then you hit the pons, then you hit the medulla. Okay, makes sense. And you'll remember that when you do, when you do lab because you'll do them in that order, midbrain, pons, medulla, okay. So that is, those three make up the brainstem. We're going to talk about each one, um, where it's at, and maybe just a few important things. Like really in general, I need you to know what is the job of, you know, the midbrain. What does the pons do? What does the medulla do? Because the medulla is a huge one. It's got some really important centers in it, and you do need to know that stuff. But as far as location, um, this picture is a little misleading because, First of all, it's a human brain, not a sheep brain, and we've been working on sheep brains. But if you look right here, where it, um, this part right here, those would be those cerebral peduncles, right? Like imagine there's your olfactory in the front. These would be the cerebral peduncles. That is where the midbrain is. Just below that, that first bubble is the pons. Below that should be the medulla, and it's kind of funky looking here, but um, we'll see different views. Okay, so what do they do? And this is just an overview of what they do. We'll talk a little bit more specific, but really if you knew this, you would probably be all right, okay? So starting with the midbrain, because the midbrain is the one closest to the cerebral hemisphere. What does the midbrain do? Well, it's got movement of the eyeball, the head, and the trunk in response to visual and auditory stimuli. It's a relay station between your cerebrum, which is the cerebral hemispheres, and the cerebellum and spinal cord. Whenever we talk about the brainstem, you can pretty much guess what this part is communicating, depending just on where it is, right? Like, think about it. The midbrain is right between the actual cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum, so it kind of makes sense that it would be the communicating point between the two. If something is gonna go from the cerebellum to the brain, it has to pass through the midbrain. So that's why it's that relay station. Okay, and then we have the pons just below the midbrain is the pons. So the pons will also bridge between the cerebellum and cerebrum and things that are passing in that area. And it regulates your breathing rate. Now, the medulla is the big guy. Medulla is super important, probably the one we'll spend the most time on. Why? Because it has the control centers for some very important things. Things like your heart rate, 
your blood pressure, swallowing, breathing. Those are all things that we need to do, right? So um, medulla is huge and important. And notice it is below the pons. Oh, okay, and I think we're going to stop here. Oh, gosh, we still have time. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. We got time. Let's just do it. All right. So you'll be far further ahead than anybody else, I think, though. All right. But you were anyways because Monday had a day off. Okay. Midbrain. Where is the midbrain? It's above... Um, it's not only above the medulla, it's above the medulla and the pons. It's the very first one. It is where those cerebral peduncles were on the outside. And um, this week you'll see it on the inside. So that is the midbrain. Um, on this picture, it is a little bit confusing, obviously. But you'll see right here, that is um, the superior and inferior colliculi of tectum. This is all part of the midbrain. So the cranial nerves that come off of the midbrain, the oculomotor nerve, the one that was flat, right? And then the trochlear nerve, that tiny little nerve that was on the waistline, trochlear. So those both come off of the uh, midbrain. The midbrain includes those cerebral peduncles. When it, where it says corpora, I should have changed this for you. Corpora quadrigeminia is tectum. I probably should have changed it so I don't um, confuse you further. And then it has something called substantia nigra, and we're actually going to talk about that um, a little bit later on because that is an important part of the midbrain. And then there's some nuclei and a medial lemniscus. Functional regions. What does the midbrain do? What does it do? Yes. Don't look at me like that, Eric. <laughs> Don't get me mad. Okay. It's going to take motor impulses from the cerebrum, the main part of my brain, to the cerebellum and the spinal cord. It's going to bring sensory impulses from the spinal cord to the thalamus, which is on the inside, and regulates auditory and visual reflexes. No. So if I had to worry about one part of this and I couldn't remember all of these functions, I would probably not worry about conveying motor impulses to the brain and cerebellum and, and taking sensory, I'm sorry, sensory impulses to and motor from because that's just a matter of where it is sitting in the brain, right? I would probably want to remember the regulating the auditory and visual reflexes. That's the one like super unique thing about the midbrain. And that if you forget, you remember that it has the oculomotor, oculomotor nerve. And I told you guys that the oculomotor nerve is the one that moves your eyeball around. So that should tie that into the midbrain too, right? Okay. Oops. Okay, the pawns. Pawns is in between that midbrain and the medulla. Um, and it links parts of the brain with one another by way of tracts. Um, here is that pons right here. Okay. And it is going to help send out information to all of the brain. Nothing special there, right? Cranial nerves that come off of pons. The trigeminal nerve, that was that big, big, fat, soft one on the side. The abducens nerve, that was that skinny little one that passed right over it. Uh, facial and vestibulocochlear, we haven't talked about yet. We're not going to see them in lab, but we will see them at the end of this unit. We'll talk about all the different cranial nerves on their own. Okay. Functional regions, well, it's my relay station, right? So it relays nerve impulses to my muscle. Um, and it is also a control of respiration. Am 
I'm Medulla. This is the big, big dude. The last part of the official brain before it goes into the spinal cord is the medulla oblongata. That's probably something you've all heard from school, the medulla, the medulla, right? Um, like most people know what the medulla does or where it is before they even know what the brain is or where it does. So what does it do? It's, it's the last part. Um, contains portion of the motor and sensory. Okay, nothing there. Let's go right to this one. Um, cranial nerves, no biggie, vestibulocochlear, that's the other branch of vestibulocochlear and the hypoglossal. Um, don't worry about the structural regions, it's got pyramids and the nuclei functional. Um, this is super important, it has a heart rate uh, center, so that's your cardiovascular center regulating your heart rate. It has a respiratory center regulating your respiratory rate. So the medulla by itself controls your heart and your breathing. That's big, right? And then it also does some other insignificant stuff like swallowing, sneezing, coughing, and hiccuping and vomiting. But the most important part really would be that breathing center and the respiratory center and the uh, cardiac center. Okay. And I think we'll probably stop. Yeah, there.